I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. Listen to the Inside Carolina podcast sponsored by johnnytshirt.com. With me today, I've got Joey Powell. The man is blowing up the throwback podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see Joey. He's got, um, I can't tell what kind of hat he's got on. Looks like some sort of hockey mascot hat. No, this uh, is a, a Durham Bulls uh, one-off from their um, Mal de Ojo night from last year. Nice. And you can put that one in the mail to me. We've also got a special guest. Um, so if you're on YouTube, you probably know who it is by now. If you're listening on iTunes or however you listen to your podcast, we've got Michael Brooker. Brooker, uh, you know, we've gotten him down in Florida on vacation. Um, he's a little <laughs> bit gimped up. He'll have to tell that story. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk to Brooke is because not too many people, in fact, I don't think anybody else in history has had the opportunity to be coached by Dean Smith, Bill Guthridge, Matt Darty, three coaches at North Carolina. We'll get into that. First, let me tell folks, if you're watching it on YouTube, wherever the subscribe button is, find it, click it. If you're listening on iTunes, go give us a rating. Joey's getting some ratings on the throwback pods. Throw me some five stars. We need some for Inside Carolina. The more ratings we get, the more likely you are to see our podcast higher up the food chain at iTunes. But let's bring Mr. Michael Brooker in. Michael, appreciate you joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about talking, uh, talking with you guys. Yeah, it's interesting. You and I have talked um, a little bit via Facebook over the years and finally got you. And I mentioned that big deal. Let, let's talk about it from really the beginning, your North Carolina beginnings, uh, from Georgia, recruited to come to Carolina. Just tell me a little bit about that recruiting process and what it was like to be recruited by North Carolina. Um, I kind of grew up wanting to go to Carolina. Um, from the time I was seventh, eighth grade, I kind of um, followed and had all the gear and watched all the games and went to camp. Um, up in Chapel Hill. I think it was my rising eighth grade year and my rising freshman year. Uh, I actually missed my first varsity practice with our new coach because I was at, uh, in Chapel Hill at camp. And so just kind of always wanted to play, uh, play there, play for Coach Smith. And um, from a small town, Sandersville, Georgia, in rural central Georgia, middle Georgia, and, um, you know, didn't play a lot of AAU. It really wasn't big back then like it is now. And so um, just didn't know if I'd ever get the opportunity to, to be on that stage, to be able to be seen by a lot of these colleges and by Carolina. So long story short, ended up being involved in an all-star game practice uh, my junior year. And um, Clem Haskins at Minnesota was there recruiting the guy. And so he saw me and ended up getting into five-star camp with his recommendation. And that's where things kind of blew up for me. Um, pretty much 95% of all of my interest and offers came from that camp playing there for two weeks and making the all-star team I actually played, uh, was coached by Christian Leitner on the, the second week all-star um, game. So that was kind of a unique experience as a Carolina fan um, for sure. And um, so that's kind of where everything jump started for me and really blew up. And so it was kind of a late bloomer situation. I had some early, small interest from some smaller schools and that's that thing that's where things kind of took off for me and got Carolina's attention and you know Michigan and some other big uh, bigger name programs so do you remember that first call from Carolina I do it was a Sunday night um, I was not too far away from from uh, committing so I was going to verbally commit to Georgia in about three or four days I think the time period was November the 8th and I think it was a Sunday so a few days before the Wednesday uh, time period started uh, commitment period started and um, got a call and if, I'll be honest with you I thought it was a prank at first because I had some friends that would mess with me occasionally about some of the recruiting related stuff and so uh, it was Coach Smith and my parents were out at the time mom was at the grocery store so we talked for a little bit she came back home and she thought I was joking as well, um, but no, nah, it was um, it was special. It was obviously something I'll never forget. Hearing his phone on the voice, uh, his voice on the phone, excuse me, and and ultimately uh, my mom kind of cut to the chase because it was late in the process for for me. And she asked, "What you know? What is there an offer, or is there just interest?" And he said there was a full scholarship offer on the table. So that kind of dramatically changed things at that moment. And so I visited the following weekend. Um, they flew down. I 
a jet to our little small airport, uh, small airport in Sandersville, and um, and so flew up and went to an exhibition game and hung out with Vince and Shamond and um, a lot of the guys on the team just had a great visit. And then the following um, week, I uh, verbally committed to Carolina. So it was a whirlwind, um, but it was uh, it was a pretty unique opportunity that I didn't want to pass up and um, felt like I would regret it for the rest of my life if I did. So, um, but uh, yeah, it was a blessing. Very fortunate to get that opportunity. Um, basically, I think they had a couple guys like Willie Dersh had been recruiting since he was a sophomore. The Babel twins had been recruiting them for a while and those guys decided to go elsewhere. So I kind of, I guess you could say was a, a contingency plan to a certain degree, but I was more than happy to, to take that opportunity and, and try to make the most of it. So that's kind of a quick rundown of, of how things kind of materialized for me from, from the recruiting standpoint. I mean, that's definitely a, a quick courtship, but you know, when, like you said, when you're a guy that's basically coming from, you know, the, the part of Georgia, that's probably the title of a, of an Almond Brothers tune, you, you kind of yeah. got to strike while the iron's hot, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, had, I had developed a great rapport with the Georgia coaches. Tubby Smith was at the University of Georgia at that time and they kind of got, they had things kind of rolling and you knew they were going to be really good. And he had, yeah. you know, really sold me as kind of the Shea Seal as kind of a player that was at Tulsa that was a really good player hmm. um, coming in and, you know, being a, a three or four year starter. So that was about 90 minutes from the house and, you know, Georgia Tech with Cremens and Vanderbilt was another one of my choices in Michigan with Steve Fisher. So, um, you know, I'd kind of developed a, a great relationship with all those staffs, all those, um, been to all the campuses and, and loved all of them. But, you know, when Carolina calls, that, that's, a, that's a different animal than it was for me, especially just growing up, wanting to play there, wanting, wanting to be um, involved. Um, it was totally so different. I hate, to, I hate to, to talk about injuries. I know that they're a big thing for you at the moment, but <laughs> I know you, you also had a, a pretty rough injury uh, towards the end of your your uh, senior year of high school it wasn't even a wasn't even a sanctioned game. You want you want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, it was um it was like two or three weeks before my high school graduation. I was um I had already obviously committed and played the whole season and uh, was in a PE class and I wasn't obviously a high flyer, but somebody was throwing me a lob that I probably wasn't going to dunk, but I was going to lay it up. And when I went to extend. Um, felt my knee uh, hyperextended and uh, felt a pop and, and so I knew something wasn't right and so I uh, set up an appointment with MRI and it, it started to feel a little better so I canceled the first appointment but then it started coming back and, and bothering me a lot so I ended up going and uh, so I had a full um, ACL tear so I had to have full reconstructive surgery ended up having it up in Chapel Hill with, with Dr. Tim Taft um, legendary Dr. Taft and so um he took care of me. I came back home and rehab for a couple months before I went up there for good and, and just rehab with, um, you know, skate, um, yeah. and the training room up there and just getting after it, trying to get prepared. Obviously knew it was going to be a long rehab back then. I think it was what eight, nine months, even a year sometimes was kind of the time frame back then. And so, you know, knowing my situation and, uh, the team they had coming back, obviously there's no need to rush me, especially. Um, so it just took our time and, rehabbed it fully and, was, and and tried to get prepared for the you know the upcoming season beyond that first year that medical redshirt year so I think in retrospect it was probably a blessing in disguise I, I wasn't quite ready um mm -hmm. to step in at that level coming from you know small town in rural middle Georgia you know small private school um you know I, I needed that strength and conditioning, even though I was working out pretty hard and was pretty strong, I still needed, you know, I needed that time to, to get mentally prepared and physically prepared to, to try to do my best to contribute at that level, play against the players that I played in and practice every day and, and um, you know, would ultimately play against in, in some games. So it was probably a blessing in disguise, although frustrating at the time. So, so you get to Carolina, you're redshirted <clears throat> those two years there, um, your redshirt year and your redshirt freshman year, they're pretty doggone good basketball players. But talk about the, uh, you know, you lose Coach Smith at the end of your redshirt year. Well, talk about that. I mean, he was getting up in age. He had talked about when he didn't want to, when he didn't feel it, he was leaving. And yeah. 
he did. Uh, just speak to that moment. Um, that, you know, that was obviously a surreal moment, you know, looking back at some of the pictures and some of the videos that you see during that time frame. I mean, we had been informed that it was going to be a big announcement and, you know, not to, not to say anything and all that kind of stuff. So this was obviously pre-social media and whatnot, but word started to leak and whatnot. But, um, you know, I think we were all kind of in shock. It was kind of a surreal moment. I think looking back now, I, I didn't at the time realize what a, um, what a big moment it was, <laughs> not only for Carolina hoops, but, but uh, NCAA hoops and just basketball yeah. in general. Um, I, I didn't realize what a, what a huge event it was, to be quite honest with you. I was disappointed. I think we're all very disappointed. But I didn't quite understand the magnitude of what was going on, being a red shirt, you know, a freshman, uh, uh, excuse me, being up there for just a short amount of time. You just didn't quite understand the gravity of the whole situation. But now looking back, it – uh, it was a momentous um, moment, uh, and so, um, but the transition to Coach Guthridge was was seamless. I mean, I, you know, he obviously was the perfect guy to take over. He deserved the opportunity and did a phenomenal job with it. And it was obviously an extension of Coach Smith, having coached with him for 35 years. And uh, I thought it was a seamless transition. The styles were identical. Uh, the method, uh, the way in which. Um, he spoke to us and coached us, you know, we were all very comfortable and just kind of just obviously had a phenomenal year with a, with a, a very um, experienced, talented team. And so um, two phenomenal people, first and foremost, but obviously coaching, coaching giants as well. So um, it was a cool time. I mean, it was obviously frustrating a little bit. I know a lot of the guys were disappointed. I think we were all disappointed, but uh, understanding where he was coming from and just tried to, to do the best we could and make it as smooth a transition for Coach Grantsbridge as we possibly could. You know, I want to talk about certainly get into some of the guys you played with. You played with just a ton of talented players, but let's talk a little bit about what I sort of led with. You had Coach Smith as your redshirt year coach, mm -hmm. and then you have Guthridge for your freshman, sophomore, junior year, and then Guthridge uh, retires. Talk about that coaching search there because – we all have heard the, you know, Roy Williams handshake. Is he coming? Is he not? He goes back to Kansas, can't leave and all that. But just talk about from a player's perspective, you guys were coming off back-to-back -back Final Fours. Um, well, no, excuse me. You had 97, 98 Final Fours, and then you had 99, I believe that was a uh, Weber State. Yeah. I remember. Oh, you got to bring it up, Tom. I tried not to, <laughs> if you saw. <laughs> I tried to cover it up. It's hard, to, um, it's hard to avoid that, right? Yeah, but then you go, um, you know, you come in as an eight seed and make a run to the Final Four there in Guthridge last year. So, you, mm -hmm. for you personally, you got three Final Fours in four years you've been in Chapel Hill. Guthridge is going out with two Final Fours out of three years. And now you're in the middle of a coaching search. And Carolina hadn't had a legitimate coaching search since Dean Smith was hired, maybe beyond that, um, in the 60s. What was that like from a player's standpoint? Because at that point, uh, social media certainly wasn't like it is now, anywhere close, but there's a lot of attention. Who's going who's gonna to be the coach at North Carolina? Um, how did you guys handle it? I think we handled it the best we could. I mean, we knew um, Coach Williams was the big fish. And, um, you know, having played with uh, Scott, his son, and being close friends with him and Brad Frederick and those guys, you know, we, we knew obviously that that was, that was kind of where we were thinking it was going. Um, but then, you know, um, that whole situation transpired the way it did. And then you start hearing different things. Obviously, like you said, social media is nowadays if that happened, um, with social media the way it is now, I mean, obviously, um, it would have blown up and been completely out of control with everything on the internet and whatnot, but we kind of heard bits and pieces. We heard, you know, um, Larry Brown and we heard, you know, we heard all the different things that were floated, uh, floated around there for a while. So, um, you know, in retrospect, I, I don't remember a ton about that time frame in regards to, to, to what it was like, um, and how we were processing it all I was just you know coming into your senior year you, you want to have an opportunity to continue to try to contribute and um, you know uh, it was definitely different every situation that I was recruited to the coaching situation changed dramatically within that 
one or two year time frame. So this was just another, um, you know, I hated to see Coach Guthrie's leave, of course. I'd love to have been able to finish out that last year with him. Um, but uh, I, I think we, we took him out on a on a pretty good note, you know, making that Final Four push and getting him his second Final Four in three years. And he obviously did a phenomenal job those three years. And, um, you know, what an ambassador he was to the, to the program. And, um, but we were just kind of um, ready to see it come to an end at a certain point, of course. And, um, yeah, it, it was unique for sure. Um, it was definitely a unique um, situation that uh, ultimately um, – so it meant how everybody you know would hope but right. <laughs> um, but we learned a lot from it and and hopefully everybody was better from it afterwards you guys took a hard right turn i guess <laughs> at least it seemed that way from out of the outside of the program yeah you, know, you go through like you said you had uh coach guthrie stepping aside and you hear the rumors <laughs> about roy williams rick majerus whomever else was larry brown i think you noted mm -hmm. and then you guys uh landed on Matt Doherty and, you know, without regarding him as, you know, an eighth choice or a fourth choice or a second choice or whatever, how did you guys adapt to, okay, this is our coach now, now we're moving forward. How was, how was he received by the team? And again, you were, you were an older, an elder statement, statesman of the roster, easy for me yeah. to say. You were an elder statesman of the roster at that time. How did, how did the team receive him? And then how did you guys move forward with ultimately what would be a, a very different coaching style than, than you were used to? I think we received him early on as, as you would receive anybody. We knew he was a Carolina guy. I, I knew he was at Kansas, you know, in the 90s there for a, str a large stretch there when I was uh, – I remember seeing him at a AAU tournament uh, when he was with Kansas. And, you know, obviously we knew uh, growing up and watching Carolina and watching a lot of the old games and, and reading about it, I knew he was a, a key figure in Carolina history as far as being on the national championship team. And, um, so, you know, I think we were eager to get started. We knew he was a Carolina guy. And so, um, you know, we were doing our best to, to be receptive and, um, so it obviously was a dramatic difference. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Um, received it very well, uh, myself included. Um, you're just so used to the style of Coach Smith and Coach Guthrie's. They recruited you and they coached you in that manner for, you know, four years, 100 plus practices a year, off season workouts. Um, and then to have a complete, you know, 180 in styles and the way in which you're coached and the way in which you're spoken to and the buttons pushed and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was, it was, it was different. It was really, really different. And um, for all of us. Uh, all the way from the conditioning at the end of the year. I think I would worked really hard in the off season and was in pretty great shape. I was about 225, 230 at about 7% body fat and ran like a, almost two miles in 12 minutes. So I felt like I was in great shape. And he put us through a training, uh, three-week running session, running workout, uh, kind of more of a mental toughness than physical toughness, to be quite honest with you. Just to challenge us physically, I think, challenge us mentally. And so I lost like 23 pounds in like three weeks. And wow. so it was um, – it was uh, he was testing us. And, and um, we at times didn't respond, you know, as we probably – looking back, as we probably should have. He was just trying to – um, see what we were made of. And so I, I think it was a, a challenge for him and um, coming in. But it was also a challenge for us just to kind of um, respond in a way that, um, you know, to a style that we just really weren't used to. Um, but, you know, um, I learned a lot from that time frame. Um, I think he's learned a lot from that time frame. I think we all have and, and came out better for it, I believe. Um, I've spoken to him several times since. And, um, you know, he got thrown into a fire. You know, Carolina basketball is is a national brand, a uh, worldwide brand, you know. I mean, to go from one year at Notre Dame to Carolina uh, in one season is a huge jump for anyone. So, um I know there's some things he would like to do differently, and there's probably some things that I and our, my teammates would like to do differently. But um, that, you, know, you kind of hit um, on something right there. Did did your role change as from from going into prior to uh, Coach Guthrie's leaving and Matt Doherty coming in? Did your role as a player and as a leader of the team change based on Coach Doherty's style? 
Um, can y'all are y'all good? Can, can y'all hear me and see me good? Yeah, we got. You. Okay, okay, I just said something. Um, um, you know, I don't know if my role will change per se. Uh, I was an older statesman. I guess not playing as much though. It's a huge difference. I mean, obviously, I think I led by example in the way in which I tried to play hard, tried to prepare my body, tried to you know do the max out with what I you know the, my gifts or whatever you want to phrase that. But um, you know, my role that year, that last year, it was kind of similar to the previous years. Played some early eight to 10 minutes. And, uh, you know, once, once ACC season started kind of dwindled down to, to not much. And so, you know, um, I just tried to be a good teammate, work hard, be the best scout team. Like I was always the guy on the scout team who was Trajan Langdon or, you know, the guy from Clemson, I think his last name was Scott, you know, the guys that were chuckers that, you know, I, I realized yeah. that I'm trying to you know <laughs> get mine in, in practice and whatnot and, and, and get off shots and stuff. But, um, just trying to make the guys um, push them and practice as hard as I could. So um, it, it was tough, you know, being older and, and kind of still seeing your role in the same manner uh, as it had been in the past. But, but you know, I, I was blessed. I was super fortunate to be in that situation in the first place. And so just try to make the most of it and try to stay as positive as, positive as possible. We had a phenomenal run there, you know, as far as I think we won 17 games in a row. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, made number, you know, got to number one, and you know, I think we were twenty-one and two at one point that last year, and and uh, kind of the wheels fell off, so to speak. Um, I think we lost five straight Sundays and and lost mm -hmm. in the second round to, to you know Penn State and, and New yeah. Orleans. So, you know, obviously uh, we had some issues towards the end there with some, you know, some personalities on the team not jiving and. and you know, between players and then between players and coaches. So it, it was an unfortunate end to a, a really great stretch there of of, good, of, of great play. Uh, we were rocking and rolling there for a good while. and It was fun and um, things just kind of went sideways. And so, you know, that was kind of um, unfortunate that it ended in the way it did because that team was, the team had some of the ability to go a lot further than we did. Um, mm -hmm. Let me uh, let me take a second and talk about Johnny T-shirt. There, of course, our sponsors. If you got a shirt like this, you probably got it um, from Johnny T-shirt. They're, they're the sponsors of this podcast. Are great supporters of Inside Carolina, Inside Carolina on the web, Inside Carolina at tailgates during football games. Go see them. Go visit them on johnnytshirt.com. Go visit them on Franklin Street when you get an opportunity. They need your support. And certainly Inside Carolina Premium subscribers get 10% off your everyday order. So whatever sale they're having at the time, key in the Inside Carolina code, get 10% extra. Johnny T-shirt and johnnytshirt.com. I see Brooker's got a shirt on. Looks like it could have come from johnnytshirt.com. Yes, yeah, nice. So it, uh, they are uh, your place to go to get your gear. Michael, you talked about the coaching differences, and we could really talk about that forever. But let's talk about some of that talent you played with while at Carolina. And I've got a – I don't know how Joey wants to do it, but I was thinking about it when you were talking about the 2001 team. Uh, better athlete, Vince Carter or Julius Peppers? Oh, wow. Whew. I knew oh, you were going to – once you started, you started that question, I knew that was – That's gonna... a setup. <laughs> I will say this, and this is probably weird, but Julius Peppers is the only a physical live person I've ever been physically in awe of. The man was a freak. Yeah, he, he is. Yeah, I, you know, it's hard to, it's really hard to not say Vince in this. You know, obviously he's an absolute freak of all freaks as far as basketball athlete and still playing, you know, at the age of 42, I can't even, finish a pickleball game without tearing my calf and he, uh, he's still playing in the NBA at 42 at, at that level so um, age is undefeated bro Vince, <laughs> Vince is the only one that scored on it yeah so um it's hard not to say him but um but I, I'd have to say Julius just just because he was obviously he probably could have been an NBA player if he really put his mind to it and his effort to it um
technical difficulties are undefeated too. <laughs> he went also true. Away. I ain't really the best player. So you know the football player as well. I think my senior year, my senior year, he decided after that he and I think uh, four back as well. But um, if all those guys had come back the next year, they'd had another phenomenal team. But that eight and twenty would have never happened. But. Uh, um, Breaking up bad, Mike. This is Michael Brooker, the Judas Priest album. But, uh, um, <laughs> I think when Julius, when we finished basketball, and he decided to go back to football full time, sixty five, somewhere around there, so he had jumped back up. Obviously, he could look at a weight. He um, obviously could look at a weight and um, and put on five pounds. You know, he was a freak and a phenomenal guy and. Um, a great teammate just I, there's not enough good things I can say about him um I contacted him a little while ago trying to get some stuff for my memorabilia room and he responded within like 15 minutes saying heck yeah just send it to me and I'll get it back to you as soon as I can oh, so just a, that's awesome. just a high level high level dude and just a beyond high level athlete I mean obviously a hall of fame football player and like I said probably could have been an NBA player if he really put his mind to it wanted to Tommy I have um, a request Hold on, hold on a second. So you broke up, and we'll stitch it together on the audio side, but for folks watching the YouTube video, you're saying Julius Peppers was the better athlete of Vince Carter. I, I didn't – Better athlete. <laughs> well, he's going to hold your feet to the fire. I said that distinctly. I, I might have – it ended up being, getting there, yes, but I didn't, I didn't come out and say it quite that. You, I told you it was a trap. You came around and you said <laughs> – <laughs> Sorry, Vince. <laughs> watching this. Uh, it's, it's convenient that his technical difficulties came up here in that part, right? I think we'll never know. Uh, just let, let the internet own that. All right, Tommy, I'm totally going to hijack this for a second. I did not give you a heads up, but I really just thought about it when, when Brooke was giving the answer about those two. Michael, how about if we play a, play a real quick game of word association? I'm going to list off some guys that you played with and give us one or two uh, quick word answers. Is that cool? Yeah, I've never done All this right. before, sure. All right, we're doing this on the fly. So, folks, if this if this tanks tremendously, then blame me. Um, all right. Uh, you said it. Yeah. Ed, Ed Cota. Uh, masterful with the ball. Just maestro, I guess you could say. All right. Um, Vasco Eftimov. Uh, super talented bull in a china shop. <laughs> <laughs> Antoine Jameson. Um, relentless summer pickup ball. Um, I watched a lot. <laughs> we, had so many, <laughs> we had so many guys come back that were so damn good. I didn't get in as much as I'd like, but uh, incredible. Um, All right, I'll throw one more at you just just because it's timely. Uh, the last dance. I could watch it again right now. All ten of them in a row. Um, Amazing theater. Um, just, I loved every second of it. Let me ask you this. A lot of people have given Jordan or, or trying to come out and give Jordan grief. I, I think to be as good or to be great like that, you have to be like he was. Your thought on that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously there's probably a few things in there that he would, he would probably do differently. And I think he said as much in a couple of those situations, but I mean, the, the relentless pursuit of perfection and, and his desire to win, I think ultimately um, he had to, you know, some, like you said, some guys have got to be pushed along and some guys have got to be pulled and when they don't want to be pulled or pushed. And so I think he did that obviously at the highest level um, with the most eyes on him. And so, um, you know, um, seeing some of those stories, I mean, watching some of those clips, I mean, you're, you know, sometimes you might cringe and be like, ah, I wish you had said that, but, um, and he probably says the same thing, but um, yeah, to be in the category he's in, um, I think his teammates ultimately understood what 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 his motives were and what where he was coming from. So, um, and probably needed it to to, to attain the level to, that they attained. They, they needed probably him to be the way he was. So, let me ask you this on related, and this is something I've always said, and I don't even know if it's relevant, but. I've never I've never met a great coach that wasn't at least somewhat of an asshole. 
Is that fair? I think so. I mean, I have some, I have some guys that, that I group text with that, that kind of say that about coach Williams, to be quite honest with you. And, and, um, but that's not a bad thing. That's no, not. I agree. I agree with you. I mean, I think, that, you know, to, to coach at that level or to coach at the level that these guys coach at and, and to be as successful as they are and to deal with the stuff they deal with, whether it be um, parents or media or whatever, or, or their, their own players, whatever. I mean, I, I do think you have to have a certain level of that um, to be able to, to survive as long as a lot of these guys survive and to be as successful as they, as they are. I think all of them are, are good men at heart and, and have, have uh, ultimately – the motives are in the right place for their players and whatnot. But, but I agree. I think you're correct. Um, you know, obviously you don't want to see a ton of it, you know? Well, but, easy transition. How do, do, do you have any, do you have any of those takeaways? I mean, you're a coach now at your, at your high yeah. school alma mater, right? I was for a while. Now I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm at a different school now. That's right. You're at a, you're at a, you started the program at this new yeah. school. Okay. That's well, tell us a little bit about your coaching style and do you take away any of those, assholeish tendencies that Tommy mentioned, or you do have any of the other things that you've taken from the coaches that you played for? I think I'm a little more, you know, I understand where Coach Doherty was coming from, and I'm at peace with how things worked out now, and I, we, we, we kind of reconnected and kind of made things right, because I'm not, I wasn't probably the best leader, and I keep, I got cussed out several times that year, and, and obviously didn't, um, didn't like it. I mean, who does? Um, but I, but I think um, I learned a lot from that time frame, and you know he was just trying to get the best out of us. And so sitting back and seeing that now, I can learn from what happened then. But I you know I'm more of a Coach Guthrie's Coach Smith kind of a style as far as when I raise my voice or when I get on a guy, um, I want it to mean something. I just don't want to be yelling and screaming all the time to where they got to figure out you know is you know what's what. Um, so I'm a little more get on and practice if I need to be a little more boisterous in practice and then in games kind of hopefully they're comfortable enough with, with the, what we've done in practice and, and that I'm just going to let them play and, and play through mistakes and you know if I have something to say to them I'm not going to scream across the court and cuss them out I'm, I'll probably take them out briefly and have a little short discussion with them and, you know be reasonable, reasonable with it not embarrassing in public kind of a thing kind of coach smith's motto there for a while for his whole career um and then get him back in and let him play but um i'm a little more that style than i am uh rant and raven i just don't know how um i see a lot of coaches doing that and i just think a lot of it's for show um right. and so i think you do the work in practice and and uh, then you just kind of sit back and, and watch in games and you know make adjustments and 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 correct however you need to correct and that's you know I yell at them some but but it's not it's not much I want it to mean something when I do sure. uh, it's, it's it's like the person that cusses all the time. Come, from a, come from a good place and not just oh there's cut cut. <laughs> I mean, that's – you may yeah, – I, I don't cuss much at all. I mean, uh, I try to uh, – I try to stay away from it as much as I can, but um, – because they are high school students. They are high school athletes, yeah. and, you know, uh, I want to be a good role model as well. But um, – so, um, you know, I try to be a little more laid back. But, you know, when you're competitive and you want to win, you know, there's, there's times where things – come out a little differently than you want them to but um, is it harder to be a is it hard to be a coach or a player that's one of the things I always hear you know guys that were players that are now coaches they always talk about how much harder it is to coach than it is to play how do you feel about that yeah I think I agree with that completely like obviously as a player there's a lot more you can do in that moment to, to try to rectify a situation or to make a situation better as a coach you're kind of <laughs> you know, you work your tail off in practice trying to put them in a position to be successful. And then once the game starts, it's there's times where I'm just like, hold on, hold on for your buckle up and hold on for your life kind of thing. You know, like some of the teams we play and the pressure we see on a nightly basis. And, you know, we're not the tallest or the most athletic group uh, out there. So um, sometimes I'm just like holding on for dear life and just, um, you know, I don't have enough timeouts half the time. I'll tell you that to try to stop something. <laughs> I know but, a coach um, in Chapel Hill that always has some. The fans will tell you he never uses yeah. them right. 
I know, right? Um, I had a team. Uh, I was actually coaching the middle school team this year as well. I'm the varsity head coach, and um, we had a situation where I had to help out and, and coach the middle school team this year as well. And so um, we went and played a team, and I knew they weren't starting their best players. I mean, I had played them before, and their best five, were they were a bunch of eighth graders, and they were loaded. They were super athletic and pressed like crazy, and so um, – they didn't start their best players. So the first quarter we were up like 11 to eight and I knew they were about to insert their guys. At the <laughs> you knew it was coming. Quarter. And they put the guys in and, and they went on a over three minute stretch, a three, three minute stretch. They went on like a 23 to nothing run. I don't know <laughs> if we ever got a pass half court. I probably call, I think I called four timeouts in like three minutes. And the guy, the, the guy at the, um, the guy at the table told, me that um, he was going to give me a couple extra timeouts because he knew I needed them. So I, I appreciated that. I don't think I actually used any more after that. But, mm. um, but yeah, I, um, I, I use timeouts to stem some of these roles some of these teams go on. That's great stories, man. The, uh, the internet is about to be 1-0 and tonight because we're starting to bog down. But um, – Last couple of questions for you before we let you get out of here and get back to your family. Um, what memory do you have most of Chapel Hill? We, there you go. I guess I can get John to stitch it back together. Yeah, he can probably magic. He can probably do some magic. Well, right now while we're here, um, if any folks are watching this on uh, on YouTube, yeah, there oh, there back. he is. He's back. Um, this this um, Wi-Fi. See, house it's not the best and so i'm trying to I'm trying to find the best spot but it's not it's not obviously blame florida it's fun <laughs> yeah we uh no look we're gonna let it ride because this is real life <laughs> covid internet we'll say that yeah. so. last question i got for you and i'll let you get out of here unless joey's got a follow-up is what's your favorite memory because i told you i printed out your bio <laughs> and it says First of all, favorite band, Dave Matthews Band. Is Dave that, Matthews is Band. Is that still well, accurate? I, I was listening to Is that like a – yes, that's accurate. Um, that was your media guide <laughs> responses. Yeah. yeah, this is a – Yeah, yeah, Dave Matthews and uh, Jack Johnson. Those are my two guys. Uh, those are two of my favorites that uh, we were listening to earlier. Seven was one of your favorite movies, I think. <laughs> yeah, Seven, uh, Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> uh, Rounders. Those are some of my favorites. So, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Tommy, Tommy looks like a professor over there with his glasses on reading his yeah, reading really. the, the, the vital documents. I can't remember what I said. I think my favorite food might have been either fried chicken or macaroni and cheese. I can't remember. Who do you that want to like... meet? Who do you want to meet the most? Like now, are you are you asking me about my answers? As a as a college senior. Um, I don't know who I said back then. Bruce Lee and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Bruce Lee, wow. Uh, yeah, definitely Arnold. I love Arnold. I love me. We actually watched Twins the other night with all the kids and stuff, and that was really funny. Was That's actually a good a kid while. movie. Nicely done, Dad. Yeah, it, it, was, it was great. Um, but, yeah, I used to love I have all the um, Flex magazines and Muscle and Fitness Arnold magazines. And so, especially Get to the chopper now. This is, <laughs> he wasn't the best actor, but I watched all his movies. Too. Hey, man, he can shoot it up now. Uh, favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger movie then? Because I think I'm – Terminator 2, obviously, is way up here. Yeah. Um, and Turtle yeah, Recall, I think, maybe. I think one of my earlier with Predator, I always loved that one. That was pretty good. Why does um, Kindergarten Cop get no love? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if I've seen that one in a long time. But, yeah, Twins was great. I – um, I really hadn't watched it in a long time, but that, that was that, that was a good one to go back and watch again and, and laugh again about. That was pretty funny. That was good casting. Last yeah. uh, favorite Carolina player. Who is it now? Who'd you say then? Who did I say then? Yeah. Um, and did I? Well, did I say Jordan? I don't know. I mean, I guess that would be like the. You said the, Pat Sullivan. Pat Sullivan. Man. Oh yeah, I love Pat. Man, Pat was Sully. Pat was actually my host on my visit uh, at one point. Uh, well, he took me to um, – golly, I can't believe I can't remember the name of it. The Pines. He took me to the Pines, and um, and then I went out with um, Shimon one night. We ended up at a club in 
Carver, I don't think is there anymore. Um, um, I think Vince and Twan and all those guys were up on the upper level uh, dancing shirts off and stuff. And I was downstairs and sleep at a table at like 2 a.m. <laughs> probably thought I had passed out drunk, but I was just tired. This, um, is, the, uh, this is the good stuff here, Joey. I would, and, so um, you're leading right into my, my last question <laughs> for you. Um, what's your favorite? And, you know, you had – you had an extra year, so you've got 20% extra time. I think that's math. I don't know. What was your favorite off-the-court memory when you were in school? And, and it can be something related to basketball. It could, it could not be. I mean, what's, what's your, you know, your indelible memory of, of your time in Chapel Hill? Um, that's a great question. I, I, can y'all sit? Are y'all good? Can you hear yeah, me? we got you. Okay. Um, to finish yeah, up don't that, try to cut out on this one. Don't try to cut out your internet I mean, on to this To finish up that last story, um, when I was asleep at the at the table downstairs and ended up getting back to Carolina in at like 4 a.m., uh, they had an exhibition game the next day, and um, Shaman was actually <laughs> late to the um, Oops. to the uh, pregame meal at Carolina Inn. And so I found out later that my mom had called Coach Smith at like 4 a.m. because I wasn't back yet. and She was concerned because we were actually sharing a room our, our, our wall you know, shared a door um and so um that, <laughs> I, feel, I feel kind of bad about that but we're from small rural georgia and they had never really been much of anywhere and so when i wasn't back about four they were kind of concerned so anyway um that was interesting to say the least um but um i don't know i think one of my favorite memories in general is just That that run in ninety nine two thousand, uh, not not a real pick, but I just think that was really cool. We struggled throughout the majority of that year, and and then kind of turned it on late and and sent Coach Guthridge out the way uh, we were hoping to send him out with the Final Four. Obviously, we didn't go as far as we would like and lost to to Florida in the semifinals there, and probably had a great chance to. I think if Ed doesn't get his fourth foul early, yeah. I think we have a chance to win that one. Um, Are we yeah, sure he got his fourth foul yet? I'm not yeah, sure that it happened. I don't know. I was actually watching that game not long ago. <laughs> I went on a YouTube, a YouTube binge where I just saved a ton of old stuff and went back and I watched the um, the game against Stanford in Birmingham. I went mm -hmm. and watched that one again. That was a really good one to watch and a lot of stuff I forgot. But um, – I think that run was probably one of my favorite memories just to be able to kind of turn all that negativity, barely making the tournament at 18 and 13 and, and to kind of send him out the way we were able to send him out, I think was pretty special. And um, he deserved that for all, all he gave Carolina and gave us. So I think that's probably my favorite, you know, not, not a super funny story or anything like that. No, but it's solid right. and heartfelt. Yeah, that was that's probably, perfect. That was probably the best moment for, for those reasons. Perfect way to end the podcast, man. Perfect way to uh, wrap it up. I agree with you 100%. Dean Smith, everybody talks about him, but Bill Guthridge, I don't think, has ever gotten the respect and the props, maybe, that he should have over the course of his coaching career and life. But a yeah, great way to end the podcast. I do appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know you're uh, on vacation, limping a little bit, but you took time yeah. and had fun with us. So. <laughs> get, get that foot healed up, man. Yeah, I know. Uh, one thing that uh, about Coach Guthrie, um, we went to is um, when Coach Smith had the, the, the – when Coach Smith passed, um, it kind of shows you what kind of guy Coach Guthrie was. Uh, I came up to talk to him, and he was – I was worried that he wasn't going to remember who I was, to be quite honest with you, because he had gotten a little far along with his – with his health and was actually obviously as you know not far away from succumbing to his illness but um I went up to him and said hey coach Guthridge um you know I even told him my name because I really wasn't sure I, I heard yeah. some stories that he was you know pretty far gone and, and I was like hey coach it's you know Michael Brooker and he gave me the little the handshake and he asked me was I still coaching in Georgia and that was really really cool that's that, awesome you know that you know the state he was in as far as mentally you know he um for him to remember that in that moment and, and to ask me if i still in georgia and how my family was that was that was pretty awesome and pretty special so yeah i was super fortunate super blessed to get the opportunity and i'd do it again in a heartbeat even if i never you know 
play it another second or whatever, I'd do it again in a heartbeat just to have those opportunities and those relationships. Um, um, so yeah, it was good stuff. So thank y'all for having me on. Mm. Yeah, man. We, uh, we appreciate, like I said, appreciate you taking time. We can talk anytime you want, you know, yeah, I'd love to. I mean, yeah, you, we hit, can. you hit me up, we'll do it again. We can, uh, Hey, 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 can I, can I get him on a throwback before you start, before you start yeah. recycling him? Can I, can I hook maybe, a guy up on a throwback soon? Maybe you can get him on that throwback right there. Oh, I like there that. There you go. Well, look, look at how he's got, he's got props queued up I off know, the stage, really. guys. You get him on that throwback and, and then, and then there's yeah, a ball back there. So. That's awesome. You yeah, got some good stuff back there. Well, um, I don't think I didn't hear you say what you said about Julius. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna send him. I don't know. I don't know if I have enough money to send him every uh, get by everything I want to send him. But um, uh, yeah, he um, he's a good dude. Like I said, he's a he's a really good dude. And actually, Vince, when I, I went to the New York Knicks um, Hawks game in Atlanta uh, a couple months ago, wasn't well, actually it's probably longer than that. This whole this whole um, virus thing. Yeah. Time it was actually COVID. it was actually 2007, but we don't remember yeah. that. I think it might have actually been like February, to be honest right. with you. But um, but I, he they were in the warm up lines, and I was standing there on the sideline. I had just gotten finished talking to Antoine for about 30 or 40 minutes with the guy I came with, and um, and uh, Vince did a layup, and I'm standing over there near half court, and uh, he looks over and sees me. Like I wasn't flagging him down or anything. I was just standing there watching, and he he came over and said a few. Uh, non-repeatable words over the podcast but you know Michael you know, MF Brooker you know whatever and so we we dapped it up and and talked for a minute so that was pretty cool you know um, so I'm trying to get back in Vince's favor if he's watching this um, <laughs> about my pick earlier but then um, one last thing and I know y'all probably have to go um, Bullock was on the other end Reggie Bullock and RJ Barrett and that was the night after Carolina had lost at the buzzer you know oh. the double buzzer beaters so we were all, oh. all obviously despondent and all um and so we said something to reggie bullock me and the guy I was with my parent and um rj barrett's right behind him just pumping his fists and laughing and it was it was really fun they ended up taking a selfie with us while they were warming up so it um it's pretty neat you know being involved with the carolina family you get a chance to see a lot of guys obviously guys that play in the nba and some, some really good people so well look let's do this i'll wrap the podcast and then if you will stay on we can keep talking and okay. people will have a reason to come check out the Inside Carolina YouTube channel. What do you think, Joey? That works for me, man. Call it on the fly. Oh, yeah. We just, <laughs> I told you, man. It's very informal. We just wing it. Call it, it on the fly. Let me wrap this. You've been listening to the Inside Carolina podcast sponsored by johnnytshirt.com. Many thanks to Joey Powell for stepping off the throwback throne to join little old Tommy Ashley on the podcast. Stop. And Michael <laughs> Brooker, former North Carolina, the only North Carolina player to ever play for Dean, Gut, Doherty, three Carolina coaches. Many great stories. If you're listening on the Inside Carolina podcast, rate us, review us, give us a, a shout out on there. If you're on the YouTube channel, stay with us. We'll keep going. But for the podcast audience, we'll see you again soon. All right. You want to keep talking? I said you've been dying to talk about Carolina. I can tell. Look, the man's locked up in a Florida <laughs> beach house with his family in a bum wheel. He's he's ready to go. He's ready to un, he's ready to unload all the all the good stories from the vault. Yeah. So that was pretty yeah, that was pretty funny. Like um, you know, Barrett just you know, obviously I as a Carolina guy, I inherently dislike all Duke guys, of course, you know. And so just for him to be real cool about it all and ended up, you know, taking a picture with us and, and just being a Seemed like a really good dude. So that was kind of cool for me to, to I think you personalize talk, those guys a little more and make, you know, they're, they're, they're no different than our guys. You know, some, some of them are, are bigger jerks. Than our guys. I kept thinking there was going to be a butt at the end of that sentence. <laughs> but, well, um, I'll they're, tell you, they're see, kind of their thing too. see if this is a fair statement about that. I think the longer you're at an institution, whether it's Carolina or it's Duke, the more hated you are by another fan base. Cause I think some of the current Duke guys, um, I mean, Zion's a sweet kid. I mean, yeah. it's tough to say anything bad about that guy. Yeah. And you know, some of the other Duke guys that weren't there to get, I guess, indoctrinated as much. How do you feel like those guys count, Tommy? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, tough to count those guys. I mean, is that fair? Because back when I, I was at Carolina from 89 to 93, so the 93 national championship, 
when was my senior year. And those Duke guys would come over and hang out. And I talked about that with Jawad a couple of weeks ago. They would come hang out, party, do all that stuff. Jawad said once the Greg Paulus class came through for Duke, those guys never really came and, and visited or hung out any time after that. I mean, I think the longer you stay somewhere, the more you're hated. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I definitely think it's an accurate thing. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, you don't have time to really hate most of those guys anymore because, like you said, they're they're there for five minutes and they're gone. You know, they're um, and you don't really view them as Duke guys. I mean, in the moment you do, but in retrospect, like when I go back and watch games on, whether it be YouTube or ESPN Classic or the ACC Network, I mean, half the or the time throwback I podcast on Inside Carolina. <laughs> I forgot that half the guys were on the team or what year they were on the team, you know. So it's kind of yeah. hard to, like you said, hard to really hate them too much when they're only there for a few minutes and then they're gone. So, and, okay. And obviously, and when they're not winning, then you don't remember them either. And I obviously remember every single player on that, the one and done's on that championship team of theirs from 15, which was an eternity ago, obviously. <laughs> um, I got uh, one for you. So in, in that vein, um, since we've now got the – since we've now got the ether – coming out of your heart who did you dislike the most uh during your time at carolina which duke player did, did just really you just couldn't you couldn't click with or you didn't job with or or you know if, if you saw him and and he needed a glass of water maybe you would you would hesitate <laughs> before giving it to him i don't know i wasn't a big fan of although it's nothing against him i think you from what all i hear he's a great i wasn't a big fan of batty a i just didn't like the way Obviously, he was a great player and, and mm -hmm. hard and all that stuff. But, you know, not a huge fan of him in, in general as far as the way he played. And uh, Dunleavy wasn't a big fan of him probably because he was my position and a lot better than I was. Right. I was probably a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> he actually came on a visit um, like my second year. I, I can't remember what year it was, but I, I knew he was a big-time recruit. I knew he was Mike Dunleavy's son and whatnot. So, obviously, there was probably a little bit of resentment there. Um, mm. But, yeah, those two guys, um, Dante Jones wasn't a – I know George, Joe, Forte was, uh, Joe Forte was really good friends with him, but I wasn't a big fan of him in general. Um, kind of brash, kind of whatever. But, um, obviously, a great player. But um, those are three that kind of stood out. Um, Whoa, Joe, he was kind of a – one of those guys, too, that slapped the floor and kind of was a – you know, the uh, uh, I wasn't a big fan of either. So the um, I, I'll tell you, covering for Inside Carolina, it was interesting to cover <clears throat> Duke games because to hear Ed Coda talk about being guarded by Wojo, and he would <laughs> he he would hold his hands out and he's like, look, and it looked like that he had been scratched by a cat or something. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, he yeah. was like. You know, you ask why I'm mad about something or whatever. It's that. Yeah. I always thought that was – it seemed like that time frame, there was a lot more back and forth because you had Coda and Carowell used to go back and forth and yeah. mm -hmm. talk and all that. I mean, talk yeah, about Mac, being in the middle of that. And then Mactar. Mactar, you know, I remember um, we were in um, – I think it was Greensboro. Um, and um, – Duke was playing before us, and we were in the back hallways back there, you know, leading back to the locker rooms, and um, Duke came running by, and uh, I think Ricky Price and Mactar had some beef at some point, and I think Mactar, if I, I think he stuck his foot out and tripped him a little bit on purpose, and so they started a little, little something in the back hallway back there, and there was some jawing and whatnot, so yeah, there was a little more animosity, I think, back then. Like you said, guys sticking around a little longer. Both teams, you know, top five, top two, top three type teams. And so the stakes were you know, pretty high, as they always are. But those teams were really both – uh, both those programs were loaded back then with just future pros and whatnot. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was, it was contentious at times for sure. There wasn't a lot of times where they came over and played pickup, that's just, you know, for sure. Yeah. You know. So fast forward to now. Um, or at least, you know, your post, your post playing career, you've now got to watch games like a fan and it's easy to get sucked into, you know, to, to being on the edge of your seat and, and being just as glued as, as, as most fans and, and most diehards can be. 
how do you temper that? Like, like how do you, do you still have any, and do you still have any superstitions? Like, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys that played have superstitions about things like, you know, you hear about Jordan and his Carolina practice shorts. What are, what, what's yeah. Michael Brooker the fan like? And then does, does he have any superstitions while he's watching a game? I used to, I used to get really upset or mad or, but now that I have my 10 year old son and he watches <laughs> all of these things with me, I obviously, and I don't want my wife to leave me either, you know, punching stuff or whatnot. <laughs> um, but um, I remember Wesley was born the year Carolina was what, 20 and 17, made the NIT and Duke won it all. Was that 09 10 season? <laughs> yes. And um, Gross. she wasn't excited with me during that year because Wesley was a baby and I was super frustrated that whole year. <laughs> My team wasn't very good. Carolina wasn't very good. Yeah. So, uh, from that point forward, I've tried to temper it a little bit more to where um, he doesn't handle losing very well. So I'm trying to be a better example. So, I internally stew a little more than externally, um, which is what I used to do. Kids so. will do it, man. I'm I'm glad yeah, you it's... called that out. I mean, kids kids will they'll break you. And I don't know if I don't know if they break you in other ways of life, and you just don't have the energy to be a mad fan anymore. But they'll some way they'll get they'll they'll work that out of you. I don't I don't throw remotes anymore. My wife will attest to <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I know. I mean, we um, you know we're Georgia fans. My wife went to Georgia. You know he. He's a big Georgia fan as a result. So when we lost to Alabama at the at the Horn, you know, in the national championship game, I had to be the, you know, the guy who was frustrated but tried to put on a brave face for him. <laughs> um, I think the same year we Duke, Duke beat us in a in a very tightly contested game, and I look over and he's just slumped in the chair, and I'm, you know I'm trying to have to pick him up, you know, mentally to pick him oh. up. And so uh, it's he's obviously helped me. Uh, um, and I'll be honest with you, when, you know, when we got guys that are coming and going now, you know, one and dones. And so it, when that starts happening, it, it, I'm invested as anybody, to be honest with you, but it, it's, it's a little harder. I understand where some of the fans come from. It's a little harder to get, like, when when Luke May and those guys graduated, Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, that that had been four years and, you kind of saw them grow. It is kind of harder to watch. I'll cheer for them like crazy, but it's a little more difficult to get fully invested when guys are coming and going so frequently. So uh, I'm as big a fan as any, but it does change things a little bit. I agree with that. I mean, like we said, it's it's tough to remember who were on rosters. Like some of these games, they, the ACC Network shows some of these old games and Carolina's playing whoever and you're like god he played for that team I mean it's like yeah. I don't even remember it and I, I'm not a fan of the one and done era I sound like get off my lawn and all that kind of yeah, stuff it's, but uh it is it is what it is let yeah. me ask you try to steer it back to your Carolina days since Joey brought it to our old age times what, <laughs> sorry about that what, what was your um what was the best game you saw what was the best game you participated in at Carolina? I'm thinking of one or two performances, but as far as the best game you were there, like you were in the room when it happened, whether you played a lot or were sitting mm -hmm. on the bench or whatever, what was the best one? Um, I think there were two as far as that really – I'd say probably as far as the crowd and just atmosphere and just probably the the game that we whacked Duke and Vince missed a boom oop off the um, yep. as oop off the backboard. The alley oop uh, that never was. Yeah, um, I, well, obviously it wasn't a super close game um, all the way to the wire. And I think the other game that kind of really st stands out just off the top of my head without putting too much thought into it is the the, the Maryland game and with all the fans, uh, the, the snow game, you know, where we mm -hmm. had 25 inches. Those are two that kind of stand out. I mean, once again, I, I don't know. I don't remember what happened that game. I know we won, but. Um, Maryland was ranked. I think they were like top 10, top 15. Yeah, Ronnie Batch. I mean, they were about to win a title, what, two years after that or something like that. So they were really, really good and just – circumstances and all the crowd coming down to students that was pretty cool um one game in a negative way was that duke game at duke when we had anton and vince and we had a big lead and they came back and won that was obviously a 
a ton of talent on the floor and whatnot. Um, that was Elton Brand, right? Elton Brand. Yeah, yeah, it was hot as it was hot as hell in there. I mean, it was like 150 degrees, and I didn't play a second. And I was sweating like crazy, <laughs> shooting top. My parents were there, they packed in like sardines right behind the bench. So um, that was a high level, tons of talent on the floor. That, that was a, a pretty good one. So, do you remember? Why in the uh, the Duke game you mentioned? That was the game where Jameson had, I believe, thirty six. Yeah, I watched and, that one recently on the, one of the marathons they had for the Duke Carolina marathon. And, and I think they said he had the ball in his hands for less than a minute or something like that. Yeah, it's insane. His 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 first second jump were just ridiculous. Yeah, he touched it, it was gone. So. Um, Stuart Scott's call on, I, I think I remember. Um, Rest in peace, Stuart Scott, man. He was an awesome dude. But his yeah. call on that, uh, I think he said, Steve Wojciechowski, how you, you like apples? And then they had Jameson Dunk, and he goes, how you like them apples? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, yeah, that Jameson was ridiculous. I mean, I, that's another guy that <laughs> he was just so yeah. ridiculously good. It was a different level. All right. I got another uh, really hard-hitting question for you here, Brooke. Your favorite Granville cafeteria meal? Ooh, I tried to put all those meals out of my mind. I think. <laughs> uh, Come on now, did they not have dine any time when you were there? No, nah, they actually Granville was had really good food. I, um, they used to have to fight Brian Reese for the. Uh, ham and cheese omelets because I would <laughs> order mine and then he'd come through and the lady would hand him mine every time. Yeah, they. Um, <laughs> I've been going back to camp, and yeah, they do have some. They do have some good stuff in there. Like the lasagna was really good, and mm -hmm. um, the baked chicken was really good here. Um, so yeah, I actually um, <laughs> Granville. Uh, we used to have a train table there for a little while, and they stopped that. Um, but uh, yeah, Granville. Uh, Granville was a place to be. Not so much now, um, although that area has kind of dramatically changed since we so were in different. school. Uh, oh, it's unbelievable. Nice. Uh, I'm a, it's I'm, truly hard to imagine what it used to be like, and, and, mm -hmm. uh, but pretty, pretty much well, now, for that matter. But um, time out, I probably ate time out from out for the first month I was there on campus. Oh, um, That's where the answers uh, in the yeah, media guide of fried chicken and mac and cheese. That's where that came from. Yeah. Brooker was basically living in time out. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh. <laughs> I got a ton more questions, but I mean, that place was that place was money, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget Billy. He used to fuss at us, cuss at us all the time. I guess he was still around when you were there, um, but he he cuss at us. And then sophomore year, we show up. It's August or whatever it was, and we show up, and he says, "Hey, blonde hair boy." Back when I had it, uh, he's like, "You a sophomore, right?" And I said, yes, sir. He was like, I said, how'd you know? He said, because you think you know every damn thing. And y'all <laughs> all like that. Every time you get here, you've been here one year, you think you know every damn thing. And I, I'll never forget that because he was right. We thought we knew everything oh, yeah. as sophomores. <laughs> Fun times, <laughs> man. It makes me feel old, especially since 1993 was what? Uh, A long time ago. Don't do it to yourself. Yeah. Don't do it off. Get my phone. I'll add it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> doesn't have enough zeros man i appreciate you coming on yeah, I, uh, thank you I, I hope we can uh you know if time permits i know you coaching during the season but i'd love to have you on during the season hopefully to have a season and we talk about some of the games some of the action but yeah man it's it's been so much fun and folks that stuck around on youtube got to hear some more good yeah, Duke stories yeah, yeah. and everything Joy, my man, I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, hopefully we'll be able to. I know last year we kind of talked about it, but uh, didn't quite get around to it, part, partly on me, but for, for sure it was on me. But, yeah, this was fun. I'd love to be able to do it again, that's for sure. Yeah, we'll do it. Joey, got anything left? Nah, man, appreciate it, Brooke. Good to talk at you, yeah. buddy. Yeah. All right, man. Hey, if you're listening and you're still here, subscribe. It's either there or there. I don't know. I'm backwards. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to inside carolina youtube check us out on inside carolina podcast thanks for joining us thanks mike thank y'all appreciate it good stuff man